Well, hi, Kate. Hi. Great to see you again. Yeah, thanks for inviting me to talk to you. Uh, first question is, how, how is it going? Like, how's the tour going so far? It's going well. It's, um, every night is a discovery. So you never know how to prepare for this particular performance because you never know how it's going to feel or what's going to happen to you or what's going to happen in the crowd. So the whole day is about doing your best to be ready for something that you don't know what it is, what it's going to be like. So then it's always a surprise. You get halfway through, I get halfway through the performance and I'm like, oh, it's like that tonight. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Or things are, yeah, th things are still happening that I knew. And I think that every night so far, it's been... Even when it's been challenging, even if there's been like technical problems or things have been uncomfortable on stage for one reason or another, there's always been some moment of revelation amongst me and the crowd together. Something happens that's new. So that energizes the whole performance, you know. That's great, because that was my next question. It's uh, in terms of the audience. Yeah. I mean, you're going, you know, all, all around the world and stuff and you, you know, the audience, you don't, you don't know the audience, right? You yeah. don't know who's going to turn up and... Uh, And I mean, you were in the US, like, was it a couple of weeks back? Yeah. Um, how do you... Um, and because your, your, your performance, is, it's about your last album, right? What we're doing is some, like about 30 minutes of older material from Let the Meet Chaos yeah. and even a few songs from Everybody Down. And then we do the whole album. So it's, okay. the whole thing is like an hour and 20, okay. maybe a little bit more. So we get... You, you get to see where this new album, what it's grown out of. You get to see the musicality and the, you get to see me rapping. I get to do that, which makes me feel comfortable on stage. And also it, I can kind of get out some of my nerves through the musicality of the earlier work before you get into this really intense performance, which is the new album. Also putting the songs like that, putting them next to each other, you see this, like the common threads going through everything. Like there are certain things that I've been talking about on every single song I've ever made. You know, like you can, yeah. these things start to become apparent. So then you, what happens by putting older work next to newer work, you set up this conversation between the words, which is cool. I like it. And in terms of doing sort of a bit of the older album, yeah. I guess you get a very different response from the audience, right? Because the, the, you know, let, let them eat chaos. It's quite, you can dance on it, right? Yeah, yeah. And how do you, how do you feel the audience when, Because you sort of then switch to um, a very poetic yeah. performance and stuff, and yeah. and so do you, my question is like, do the audience react differently? Do you see them when you when you perform? Like, yeah, they do react differently. What happens? We have learned is that if you give the audience permission to to dance, then they respond to the musicality of the later stuff. You know, the more poetic work. It's still especially live, it's still musical, like there's still beats. But if you, don't, if you don't set it up correctly, people think it's an accompaniment and, you know, they don't allow themselves to, to move to the music. But if you start the set with, with the beats and with music, then it just creates a convention in the room where even though we go into the more poetry um, stuff, it becomes, like, heightened, you know? It's like, yeah. it becomes musical as well. People, I can see them. Sometimes I can see them too much. Like we played Amsterdam, beautiful venue, Paradiso. And there's people everywhere. It's like three tiers of people really close to the stage. And it, because there's a white ceiling, it's very reflective, the light, so you can see everybody. And sometimes it makes you feel a bit exposed, you know? You're like, oh, you realize what you're actually doing. I'm on a stage with all these strangers saying all this stuff. You know, it's like the spell's broken a little bit and it's like, oh. When when you become t when I become too aware of um, the reality of what's happening, it can freak me out, you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I totally get it, and that's what I wanted to ask you about as well. I mean, you I've read sort of interviews of you, and so mm. you've started doing hip hop and spoken words early, right? Mm. And but I guess when you start first, like when you write, mm. when you're like whatever twelve twelve years old, and you write, it's for yourself, right? Mm. You never think what I write is going to then be spoken in front of like a thousand, two thousand people. So how does this, I mean, does this change the, the way you write? That now that you used to play in small s spoken word 
clubs in London or whatever, you know, and, and now you're playing in 2,000 whatever people venues? Um, I think that what, what happens with the writing is progression, hopefully. Like as, as, you, as I move through my writing life, hopefully I've become more confident and I understand more about my voice and the possibilities of my language, etc. So of course the writing changes, but I don't think that you write for the rooms. It's not like I'm ever thinking about the audience in the moment of conception of an idea. Like in performance, it's all about connection and it's all about who's there. And it, it, when I'm recording, it's all about connection, communication. I'm, I'm thinking constantly, how do I make this about the connection between me and whoever might be listening? So when it comes to getting on stage, yeah, definitely my stagecraft reflects the bigger rooms. But when I'm writing, when I'm in the studio, I don't think about the audience at all. I just think about the idea. And if anything, like, you, I feel myself on this line that goes back to the, my beginning, you know? And, like, sometimes I just, I feel that I stray from the line and I have to, like, put myself back in, you know, I suppose like all of us in our lives, suddenly you, re you realise that wherever you're at in your life, somehow the kid that you were started that journey you know so sometimes I think back to that kid that was like 12 and you know I have some communication with that that I don't know. and is it I mean and what about success because I mean what you just said I guess it's about also remembering where you're coming from right in a way but success can sort of blur that a little bit I guess and uh and also as a, as, a, as a writer, it's different saying stuff in front of 10 people and saying stuff in, two, in front of 2,000 people in terms of sort of the, resp the responsibility you have as an yeah, artist. But you know what? Yeah. I think it's easier to talk to 2,000 people than it is to talk to 10 people, man. It's so hard to walk out in front of an empty room and be like, engage everybody, bring them with you, let everybody feel comfortable in your presence. When, when it's a really small crowd, um, that can be tiring. Like, and I spent a very long time doing that, yeah. playing to empty rooms and like doing support, support tours and, and just getting up when there was, no, um, there was no other poets or lyricists or anything. They would just put you in the middle of two like, punk bands, like a squat rave, or you'd go on. I would just be so desperate to rap. I would go on, you know, like over... A, like jungle DJs or you know anything like I just wanted to get on the mic so when you've been through that kind of thing then suddenly when you've got this big stage and 2,000 people and like lighting and it's it's um it's much easier really to enter into this like Kate the professional performer who's got this message and got this show like when we were just in the States, it's like you go back, you go back, you know, a few paces because you're new there and America's so big and, like, obviously our, my music is very difficult to place, especially in America. It's like, where do they play that on the radio? What is that? So when we go to America, we might play to a couple of hundred people, you know, maybe less. Like, I played a gig to, like, 26 people in America. like this. In, the, in this tour? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Damn. It was cool. It was in, like, this kind yeah. of foyer of this, like museum it was bizarre and like that that's like a reality check you have to be like right this is actually I mean it's more special in some ways for the people there because it's so much more intimate but for you it demands a whole different it's like it's a kind of humbling experience to be like oh yeah this is what I tried so hard to stop doing <laughs> do you know what I mean well, I still love it but yeah. and do you do you now feel like like when you get on stage and stuff, or maybe you've always felt that, like, yeah, be, you know, this is where I belong. Like, or you, or you, or you, you still have this, you know, anxiety and stuff and this about, damn, is this really what I'm doing? You know what, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, I have a lot of anxiety about it. Sometimes when you're, when I'm halfway through, like Europe is lost or something, it just it just strikes me what I'm doing, and it's like this is fucking mad. Like, what am I doing? Like, what? You know, like there's so many lyrics, and you're just flowing. And we we play that song right at the beginning of the whole show, so usually that's when 
all the nerves are really, really present in me at that point. I come out, I get mad nervous beforehand. I come out and it's like, intentionally we put that song up front because it's really the only song that anybody knows. And also it's like, um, <laughs> uh, it's a good release for me because it's so, once it's out, it's like something's happened to me where I've kind of, um, I've set the pace in some ways, I've let, let it out. But yeah, sometimes I find myself just like, what? <laughs> You just, you just check in with it because I think like with any of us, you just do what you do because that's what you're doing. You know, you, it's quite rare to find the presence of mind and the presence in time to like really select and choose each motive and action in your day. You know, even something as direct as performance, even that to be like, I am choosing to walk out and rap all these lyrics and then do this performance. I mean, yeah, I do feel at home on stage for sure. Like, I feel at home with my lyrics. Like, it gives me a space to exist. But at the same time, it's a completely foreign concept still. It's like, if you allow yourself, it's like a switch in the mind. If you allow, if you la if you allow the switch to flick, it can just feel like the weirdest thing to be doing. You know? It's yeah, like, when you start sort of realising what you're doing, yeah. right? Yeah, that's, I guess, the worst. Yeah. And, I mean, you mentioned before, like, You know, not forgetting where you're coming from and stuff. Mm. You come from a pretty working class background, I guess, right? Well, actually, I, I, my family were pretty well off. Like, we grew up in quite a working class neighborhood. Okay. And, but my old man was, he trained up, he, I'm the youngest of five kids. Yeah. And uh, by the time I got to about two, so at that point, everybody else, I had five siblings, my dad retrained as a, a lawyer and so we were we were affluent he he um he did really well you know he he was kind of a radical guy but then he totally bought into the capitalist hmm. um dream you know hmm. and he and like my mum then stopped working and looked after us and I don't know we I I Luckily, never wanted for anything. It was yeah. it was a beautiful sacrifice that they they both made. But um, the neighbourhood that we grew up in was very working class neighbourhood in South London. Was it Bro Bro Brooklyn? I grew up in Lewisham, yeah. In Lewisham, okay. And um, yeah. it was like when, but when I was growing up there, it was majority kind of West Indian, mm. big kind of Afro Caribbean community, and like quite a lot of Irish actually as well and just like a normal just normal life you know went to just but my experiences as a as a kid my kind of formative years of what I saw and also the politics of the area and things like that were I don't know they've given me a particular kind of uh, attentiveness I suppose a willingness to like to understand my privilege and to, and also to see it in a certain light because um, I was always aware of how, uh, of how lucky that, that is, you know. I always could see um, there was a lot of struggle around, mm. do you know what I mean? I, it, it wasn't as if I wasn't aware. Do you, know, do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, of course. And in a way, like, I mean, from the outside, you're, you're writing, I don't even know if I can put it this way, but it feels very naturalistic. It feels like you, you contemplate something and then you find the words to express what your eyes have seen, which is a, a talent, right? It's, it's very hard to do. Uh, oh, <laughs> I mean, no, it's very hard to do because I, I, I don't know. I, I, I feel like shit, this is what I want to say, but I can't say it the way, you know, the way, wow. no, what I want to say, no, not everything, you know what I mean? Like, but you, I know a lot of people, a lot of my friends and stuff, yeah. found through your music that it, it was what they felt inside, but they it, it couldn't really express it or at least couldn't express it in such beautiful ways. So what I mean is, 
how do how do you sort of balance the fact that I mean, first is is it the way you write? Like you you have your eyes wide open and you you see what's happening to you and you see what's happening to the people and then you is that is that what you do? Yeah, I think it's um it's about attention to detail. I think that a lot of my writing life has been about trying to um kind of um what's the word like celebrate the tiny tiny things that that give you all of the sense and the feeling it's very small things that that people do or that that happen in a in a moment in like a conversation it's a very small thing that actually um gives me all the feeling just the way somebody picks up a cup of water you know it's like oh i see i see something i think it's also about sensitivity Often I think that writers, musicians, people that are drawn to be creative, they have this huge well of sensitivity. And um, it's, a, it's a huge blessing. It can feel like a massive burden, I think, especially if, uh, if you don't have access to your creativity. You just have this sensitivity inside you. It can send people into all kinds of different pursuits to try and settle this, this well, you know. But if you do have access to that creativity, I think what happens is that if you are able to tune into the world at that frequency, then it's kind of your responsibility to do something with that because not everybody can, you know, and everybody needs at some point to name some of the unnameable things. And it just so happens that poets are very good at that. They put a name on it. Like in my life, there's been so many instances of me reading something and me, exactly as you say, me saying, that's it, that's my feeling. But I wasn't able to get there. I had to read somebody else. And it, and it just connects me to myself, connects me to my experience, connects me to them. And it's, um, it's a humanizing thing, you know. It really helps me to escape from the numbness that is a requirement of the times. And so I think that it's just about tuning in. And then sometimes you manage to tune into something which is uh, common, you know, that is that is a communal thing. And because um, you were saying, I mean, you were quite affluent when you were a kid, living in a, you know, sort of multicultural, if it's the right word, neighborhood. Right. But I mean, through, I mean, you're writing, you write a lot about the um, disadvantage in a way, right? The so mm. do you feel. I mean, you, you mentioned that, right? But do you feel this sense of responsibility because where, I mean, now I've got a mic, mm -hmm. I've got thousands of people in front of me, um, millions that are listening to my album. Um, do you feel like as, as someone who has privilege in a way, mm -hmm. who is privileged, mm -hmm. you know, you have to use your voice to speak about the ones that don't? Or yeah, I mean, I think it's very important in this day and age to be fully aware of your privilege, my privilege, and the fact that I'm in this position speaks about my privilege anyway. Do you know what I mean? When I was, when I was coming up around different rappers, MCs, poets, you know, what, why is it that I have this position to speak? Um, and, those, and the other poets that I came up around don't. You know, that's about... That's about class privilege. It's about my, you know, my my race, um, my looks. You know, this like you know all the, all the things like all the things this like the kind of all the things that allow me to kind of get in under the get round the back door. You know, looking kind of harmless to people. You know, um, but I mean, in terms of what you say about, do I feel? Uh, a kind of responsibility to speak for underprivileged. It's not really like that. I, I feel like definitely if you have a mic, if you have an audience, yes, it's extremely important that, you're, that you know your motive and that also the creative calling to me is, is serious. I take it really seriously. And although I wouldn't say that I'm trying to speak for anyone, I would say I'm trying to speak to people like, and, and with people. And the thing is, what I write, is observations of what I know. So I have had, I have lived a complicated life and I have been many people really in my life. There has been many phases that have been um, 
very revealing in different ways. Like I've been through some like things that I don't even realize how they've affected me until it, it starts to come out in the writing, you know? Um, and I feel like my work is usually a conversation with the different selves that I carry around, the different parts of my life that creep in and out and that I'm trying to kind of bring it into this space and settle. So that might sound quite selfish, but I feel like by being really attentive to what's going on in my internal landscape, it allows people to check in with their own, like we were saying earlier about um, reading something or hearing something and saying, oh, that's how I feel, that's what mm -hmm. I think. I think in performance, definitely what I'm trying to do is reach out and connect and be be on this wave with the people in the room. Like it's, that's about trying to willingly make something happen. But when it's me and the pen, it's, just, it's, it's like, it's a bit of a mystery, like really. It's all this stuff comes out, things that I've seen, things that have happened, like somebody that I've loved, somebody that I've lost, like grief, um, you know, so much of my earlier work was about a very particular set of circumstances that I was trying to deal with. So much of it is all about that. And um, I don't, it's not as if I sat down to, to work that out. It's just what came out, you know. And it has been the case since I was 16 and I started running around everywhere with a pen and a piece of paper. And, like, it just became natural to, like, to think of life and writing in the same bracket. Like, they're the same thing. You know, I live, I write. <laughs> it's nice. That's it. And actually, that's the question I wanted to ask you. You you mentioned like you're walking around with a, a pen and a. Are you like very, like professional and organized about your writing? Do you say like, okay, when you're not touring every night at eight, I'm going to sit down in this space, in this office, or in this basement and write, or it's it's very organic and you just, you know, write as you go and as ideas sort of pop up. It's different all the time. It's um. It's usually the case that if I have a deadline to meet, um, then I have to fit that into the, like whatever I have to do. It's like, okay, I've got to hand in a new draft of this play that I'm working on and that needs to be in next week, Tuesday. So then I need to write, blah, blah, blah. Mm. You know, it's really unromantic sometimes. It's just, it's just really practical. It's like, oh, fuck, I've got, I've got to write 600 words today. I better go and find somewhere I can do that. And other times... When I'm in the studio, it's like if I'm in the mode, I can write from 10 in the morning when we start, you know, have a cup of coffee and get going. And I could be writing till 10 at night, like nonstop in the studio. And, I, and it, it doesn't feel like it exhausts me. It feels like it's just it's on its way. I get on the wave and that's it. It's, it's, it can feel endless, which is beautiful. And then other times, a lot of often one of the problems I think that people can probably um, relate to in their own lives is that when you start to do Uh, professionally what you what you do creatively when you have a a job that requires that creativity from you you can forget to be creative just for yourself you know, if it's always coming out for projects or um, then sometimes it's the last thing you want to do to like switch off from work is to do the thing that you do at work but actually it's the thing that I need to do the most is write mm. just for myself mm. not for a novel not for a play not for an album Just sit down and write. So usually I know that I haven't done that if I start to feel like, you know, a bit pissed off or something. <laughs> so I need to sit down and write, you know. You mentioned like the internal thing, you know, you, you, you want to, you write about what's happening to you internally. And when I listen to you and, uh, and you write, and you talk about London, yeah, I feel like that London... For you, and I think a lot of people can relate to that. A city can be as much external as it is internal. You know, uh, you, sometimes you you know, like, oh, this is my my city, and uh, because it it creates is creates stuff in you. I mean, I know I'm from France, but every time I go back to London, mm. I feel something, and I go, this is my place. There's something of. So you write really beautifully about London. Uh, And I think when I write, when I listen to you, London becomes pretty much this character, this sort of livable thing that uh, that is sometimes violent, loving, raw. Mm. But also when I listen to you, I feel there's a, a sense of longing for something lost. 
Yeah. Could you describe what you feel about London, this this city, or, or what does it represent? Does it represent something much bigger in a way? Yeah. So London, perhaps I can put it this way. I, when I was about 14, I stopped going in, into school uh, and I just started hanging out uh, because I, I was excluded. I wasn't doing very well in school and I still got to sit the exams at the end of the school. They're called GCSEs anyway, but I just wasn't, I had this job in this record shop and I just was hanging out all the time in London, in, in Lewisham, where I'm from. And, and it, and it begins to have this like, it's, it was at that time that I started to journey further and further away and you know, I started started to understand the geography of the bigger city you know when you start to like wow not this isn't just where I grew up but I'm in I'm in London like it started to strike me the opportunities for like music for hearing music and for like going to parties and all that kind of stuff that happens suddenly like the pace picked up in my relationship with the city and I began to well grow into myself as well and then I, I went to I went to college uh, a couple of years later and It was in a different part of the city. What I'm trying to explain is that as I have grown up, the city has had this huge impact on my identity and my life. Like it has taught me almost in a parental role about what life is, could be and should be. And it has shown me like the greatest injustice. Like I've seen that in the city and also the greatest justice, you know. So, so much of the world is in London that for a writer interested in people, uh, it was it was just the most exhilarating, energizing, dangerous place for a while. It was like, there was so much I was learning every every day. And also because I had this application to this talent that I, I was trying to nurture, I wanted to be a rapper, I wanted to write, I wanted to be like out there all the time, getting engaged with like opportunities to be rapping and so I was just like I was hungry for London and it, I think at that time there was so much possibility and um I would push myself to the limits of what I could do and get you know when you're an adolescent with a creative passion it's like nothing can stop you from just Yeah, from just trying to meet that feeling of like, I want to get on the mic or I'll be with my friends and I want to stay up all night and I want to see the morning come up somewhere new and da da da, or whatever it was. Like, it was, it was an exciting time. So in some senses, this kind of lost London that you can probably see in my work is, it may well just be childhood. You know, those, those days are gone. But at the same time, London has changed. It does change. And like when I was 18 and living in New Cross and what, what I would see and feel as I walked around was, um, it was so affecting. It became a huge part of my internal landscape. It taught me everything. It was like, it's my foundation. And that New Cross doesn't exist anymore, you know. Those places that were um, revelatory for me, not only has that time passed, but those places don't exist. The people that were always in the neighborhood are not there anymore. You know, I saw someone had a t-shirt on the other day that just said, um, Regeneration is segregation, is what it said. And I was <laughs> like, well, do you know what? Right. Like, I think that for a lot of people, they leave home. People I speak to, they, gr they grew up out in, in places, not in cities. And they leave home when they're teenagers and they, and they go and they try and find, the, you know, they try and find life in the city, they get a job. But then when they go home, they get to... Maybe, they, maybe, you know, maybe it's a strange thing to go home after that because home is different and you're different, but... The buildings are the same, but where I'm from, Lewisham, like it's, it looks completely different. There's like all these mad kind of skyscraper buildings they've built to house these crazy like, you know, one, one and two bed flats for like half a million pounds, like <laughs> crazy mm -hmm. stuff. Like, and like, I don't know. So the, the spectre of the lost London is, You know, it's like, I think for every Londoner that is really, really trying to stay in their city, you have this um, relationship to the to the changes that are happening, yeah. which is just, it's just, it's hard to explain because it's, it's so violent. Uh, yeah. And yeah. it's happening. We don't know what's going yeah. on. It's just happening every day. Like when I get home off this tour, it's going to be different. There'll be something different. It will look different. 
some building will be knocked down and there'll be flats. Like the swimming pool won't be there anymore. Like literally that's what happens. You come home, you're like, wait, where's the swimming pool? Oh, it's luxury flats. Like it's yeah. just mad. It's mad. I mean, you use the word violent and that's exactly what what I wanted to, to say. Like when when I go back to London now and then, yeah. that's the first feeling I feel of violence. Like when I when I see like so many places I used to go to that have gone you know the pubs are now like betting betting shops and yeah, stuff yeah. and yeah. and it sort of scares me because i really see this london as some sort of a blueprint for vulture ultra capitalism you know mm. how far can we go in pushing this capitalism stuff through you know mm. in your in your mouth and i'm um, You know, Brussels, for example, right now is you still, I think, can find you don't have like Costa and Starbucks all all over. Right. You mm. still have like small Italian cafes and stuff. But my worry is that that's what's coming. London is what's coming to Brussels and it's coming to other cities and stuff. Mm. Do you, what do you think about that? I don't know. I feel like. I hope that isn't the case, because what happens is. The complete destruction of the of community. Like, it's very rare for me to bump into somebody that I was that I grew up on. This I still live in the same area, right? Well, further out, but like in the one million pound flats, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> I'm doing really well. Yeah, <laughs> like, um, and it's it is very rare. Like, if I bump into somebody that I grew up on the same street as, for example. It's always like, wow, oh, wow, like it, it's a, it's not like it used to be where I used to love staying in that area because as things started to go better with work, I would come home and see people I've known since I was four. Like mm. it's not, it's just, it's different. Like um, there are still, there, people are hanging on, definitely. Like I, I still feel there is a very strong community in South London. There's a very strong musical community. And people really are like digging their heels in and really trying to, continue to have studio space to work in, all, all things like this. People are really still trying to make music in South London and there's a big there's a big wave at the minute of music from South London that's getting out into the world. You know, the jazz that's coming out of South London right now, everyone wants to know about it and the, obviously the rappers and there's like a big kind of guitar band resurgence as well. Lots of like Black Midi and Squid and all these guys, you know, people are really into them. But you said... You, the question was about Brussels and London being, is it going to happen in Brussels? I I can't really... I, all I know when I travel in other places, when I'm in New York, for example, I can see it, you know, I can see it happening. But it just, because I know London so well, that's where I see the impact and it's it feels the most violent. But at the, I, I also I feel like I've kind of got nothing of value to say about it. I just... I'm just aware that it's happening and I'm kind of lost for words really when it comes to like what I even feel about it. It's just like, it's just a mad thing. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I mean, something else, you, you seem very aware that it's happening. I mean, you write about some of your lyrics, you know, my, my country is coming apart. Mm. I against we, against them. Uh, this is how it begins. This is how it will end. And then you mentioned more empathy, less greed, more respect. Um, We're talking about London, what's happening now in the UK mm. with, with Brexit and stuff. Mm -hmm. is, is all about that, right? Um, and again, you, you, might, you just said you, you might not have anything to say about this, right? But how do you, how do you feel about this? Where is this coming from? Because you know? uh, like, Brexit doesn't mean only Brexit. Brexit means a lot of sh shit and, and bad things that people can say and do about each other and stuff. And the simple fact for me, what shocks me is that even though we now know that the old Brexit campaign was built on lies and stuff, mm. people don't, a, a lot of the people don't seem to care, you know, and, and seem to, to say, yeah, you know, it's lies we want to believe in or something. I think that it can be a, an attractive um, It, it can be attractive to, to believe in something, you know? Everybody needs that. Like, the, the thing is, it doesn't really matter. 
if the Brexit campaign was built on lies or not. Like, because the fact of the matter is people um, are going through some... Um, they have they have some blame, some anger. Like that, that that Brexit is symptomatic of a wider problem. When I wrote that lyric, it's coming to pass. My country is coming apart. It, Brexit wasn't on the even on the horizon. It was pre all that. They hadn't. There was not even a referendum yet when I wrote that. It was about something that is deeper in the country, something deeper that's in the psyche. Like I was talking to this guy just two days ago outside a venue. Um. He lives in Europe now with his wife and he was saying to me, he worked in the venue, we were just hanging out afterwards and he said to me like, oh, you know, my family voted for Brexit and like, and I live in Europe like, and I'm married to a Dutch woman, like, you know, and, um, but they didn't, they don't even, he was saying that his family not, are not even thinking of it like that. Like what they're thinking of is there's loads of Polish people taking my jobs. That's what they're thinking, right? And so when you... Which is a lie, right? Absolutely, yeah. absolutely, but... The, the problem is there is a need for um, to put all of this feeling of like stuckness and trappedness and and, uh, and why why is my life not going the way that I've been sold the dream that it should be going? You know, it's it's the system that is faulted. It's the system that is not is not working. But then. The need, the need to scapegoat, to blame, to have something that's easily understandable is, is huge. And I understand that. And the thing is, we're in this moment in Britain where it's like, it's so vicious, one side against the other. And it's like, it's so factional. And I, th I suppose that's the same throughout Europe, actually, at the minute. But, and I suppose that's always been the case, actually. It's, the, it, it's just come to the surface. Now there's some something to kind of wear you know yeah. there's now there's a belief to wear it's just it's kind of horrible and like my whole thing at the minute what i what i'm trying to focus on because i have the luxury of being able to make music is to just get past what divides us and just think about what connects us like i i want to just get closer to this idea that no matter where you stand on this or that political spectrum there is commonality and obviously you there are certain issues that you you know you need to know where you stand on them i need to know where i stand on them but increasingly i just i feel like it's more important to focus on what connects us and what mm. keeps us together because it's like everything is pulling and pulling people apart. It's getting violent, you know, it's like, and it's so easy to get caught up in it and be like, I'm on this side because, and you're on that side because, and it's, everybody's entitled to their opinion. And some people have done a hell of a lot of research and reading into this thing. And they really do think that this is the best thing for the country. And I, who am I to say anything about that? I don't fucking know. Like, all I know is that it feels like a... Um, if it just, you know, as, as a lot of people feel in their own situations, for example, what's happening in Spain, you know, what's happening here even, you know, it's like, it's yeah. a time of transition. Something's definitely moving. And I feel like it's been coming for many years. I felt this like approaching movement for a long time, I think. So it doesn't surprise me. And it's also about the other, right? And I think politics sometimes can, can that's a weird thing. They can fuck everything up. Like you can, for example, spend one evening with someone you don't know anything about. Mm. You get along very well. You, you joke about things. You talk about movies and stuff. And then you get to know this person and then, I mean, I'm talking about a, like, sorry, a personal experience with yeah. a friend. Yeah. And then when uh, there was the mayoral election in London ages ago, he told me I voted Boris Johnson and I love this guy. Mm. And suddenly, uh, you know, it's very weird. Why would I not love him anymore? Because he voted Boris Johnson. But I, so in a way, like you, I thought I knew him, Yeah. but maybe I don't, or maybe, maybe I don't know. Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. Mm. But the thing is, it's like this thing about empathy, mm. this radical yeah. empathy. Like, 
Okay, so I believe personally that Boris Johnson is a poisonous character. Mm. I believe that his policies are dangerous and I think that he's... I disagree with him politically, but I don't disagree with with your ability to choose on your own merit, like what you think. So I don't know the way that I was raised and the people around, like there is, you just distrust Tories. Like that's it. Like that you don't like, they're bad. Tories are bad. That's what you're told. And like, because they're what they want and what they believe in, it's, it's dehumanizing, you know, given this is just, this is an inherited truism that I have. So, and I'm sure that on the other side of it, like loony lefties or whatever, like, you know, yeah, that it goes, it goes yeah. the same way. But then if I believe in empathy at all costs above and beyond, then that needs to extend even to Boris Johnson. You know, I need to be able to say, well, you know, he's got a really tough, a tough job or like there's there has to be and this is going to like really upset some people to hear me saying that I'm sure but like this is how I believe it is and it should be like and that if there are if you can sit down with somebody who votes for Boris Johnson I know I know a bit about your politics mm. so I know that you don't agree with mm. that like agree with him so but if you can sit down and chill and spend some time with a the person then that's a really important thing to just to remember that outside of all this noise if you turn that frequency down of who's right, who's wrong, I'm I'm us and you're them. Yeah. There's commonality there. And like, especially as we're heading into this kind of accelerated moment, you know, of like environmental destruction, yeah. <laughs> like it's really important. I don't know. And also I feel like as part of, if, if we want to change things, Empathy is key, right? Because if we keep saying like sort of lefties, people that voted for Trump and people that voted for Johnson and for uh, whatever his guy in Italy and stuff, mm. they're just rednecks, bozos, you know, we never going to be able to yeah. do anything, right? Because like, they're not yeah. anyway. I don't like that kind of discourse and I do hear it a lot. I'm like, you know, this like, I, people like just can't understand how this has happened. It's like, come on, of course this has happened. Like, where have you been? Like, of course, this makes perfect sense. But I just, um, I, I also am aware that it's my privilege allowing me to say, you know, empathy at all costs, because I'm not on the receiving end of, uh, of racist abuse or violence. Like that, that allows me to say like, well, you know, um, empathy even to them, you know, but it, and I, and I just I think it's important that I just state that I'm aware of that and the kind and the all the kind of hypocrisy like evident in that. But I just it's just a feeling that I have right now. This is the setting of my compass right now. Is this this desire, this willingness to just to connect at a more eternal level? You know, Jung talks about the spirit of the times and the spirit of the depths. And this is what really moved me as I was going into the process of writing this album. I wanted to write an album that had at its core a conversation between the spirit of the times and the spirit of the depths. Because I relate to that. Like the spirit of the depths is what calls me to write my poetry. Like that's where, that's always been the case that I lived on this particular line that was deep. <laughs> like even when I was young, like that's what I was into. I wanted to know about eternal things. And, um, I was always drawn to this, the eternal wisdoms. You know, when I was reading, that was the stuff I wanted to read about. But the times, the spirit of the times is so, um, it's so loud at the minute it, and, it, and it confuses things. It takes us off track. So if, if we allow ourselves to pan out a little bit and just think about life as a global concern, you know, like, my partner is um, originally from Algeria and her roots are Sufi, Berber, Sufi and Berber roots. And I've been learning a lot about, um, about Sufi mysticism and poetry. Obviously, I'm really interested in poetry, etc. And I've been learning so much about <laughs> just recalibrating your your kind of inner compass you know it's we get so cluttered mm. and concerned with like the western model 
But this is just a drop in the ocean, really. Because like, yeah. you know, it's nothing, right? It's nothing. It's nothing. Like If you really like zoom out of it, you think that people walked from Yemen to Algeria across the Sahara Desert. It's, like, it's <laughs> just like, okay, reality check. Do you know what I mean? Okay. Hum humanity, like humanity survives and is capable of such powerful things. I mean, it's what's more troubling for me at the moment is what's happening with migrants, you know. This is the thing that I think... This, is the, this I think, will be the defining... Uh, the, def the, the definition of our age yeah. is how we handle this yeah. and what's about to happen with you know, the climate and yeah. what that will create in terms of waves of migration. And, and I think that the panic that people are feeling about borders and this is the dangerous thing for me. I wonder what's going to happen with this, There's, you know. I was talking to a friend about this actually uh, recently and he said, first thing we should do, because semantics are very important, we should stop calling them migrants. We should call them life seekers because they're not leaving their countries because they don't like their countries. Or they're, they're leaving because there's war, there's famine, there is no water. Um, and um, look, I don't want to keep you too long. So, yeah, yeah. I, I, But I've got two things I want to ask you about. You mentioned like it was easy for you maybe not to, to say I've, I've got to show empathy towards whatever Trump and, and Johnson because I'm not at the receiving end of racism and stuff. Mm. But you were at the receiving end. Was it two years ago? Yeah, two years ago. And, you know, and in between of very violent attacks, right? violent like death threats and stuff because of your support. And anyway, I, I was going to say of your support for Palestinian rights, but um, I guess it, it's a broader thing of your support of everybody, you know, having the same rights. So Tempelhof in Germany was two years ago when you had, you cancelled the performance, right? It wasn't cancelled by them. You had to cancel the performance, I guess, for security reasons, right? Death threats and stuff. Sort of in insight, like it's been two years now and you've been playing in Germany right, two days ago and you were go, you're going to go play again in, in a few weeks or something. How are you affected by this? I mean, and did he scare you and you felt, fuck, I better shut up now? Or did it sort of empower you and go, no, this is my beliefs and this is what I'm going to stand for? You know what, both. It, it both, both of those things happened. The reason we cancelled the show at Tempelhof is because the show was meant to be in solidarity with migrants, with life seekers, if you want to call them that. And there were lots of people who were being perm temporarily housed, sorry, um, in in what was once an airport, as I understood it, that's what was going on. And we were going to go there and play a show and the proceeds were going to go and help them. And then there was all this violent, um, there's a lot of violence and threats coming my way. Um, and then there was these protests planned, these kind of pro-Israel protests. Um, and I just felt that was a dangerous thing to bring to people who had already suffered so much. And what and a lot of them coming from Islamic countries, I just felt like I didn't want to bring a kind of a violent protest to where people who had already experienced so much violence were temporarily housed. It just didn't feel right. It didn't feel like the responsible thing to do. So that's why we cancelled that show. It just felt like, no way am I going to be responsible for bringing that to these people. Like, fuck. And then, I mean, like, last... We did a festival a couple of months ago in Germany somewhere and there was like a, a, a kind of protest in the crowd uh, with like a little banner and this guy tried to get on stage and I mean, it, f it, was, it was violent but do you know what, like I said to him in the moment, I was like, I love you, like, I love you, I love you, I'm so glad that... He That, we, that this dialogue is, is open, that we live in a space where I can have this opinion and you can have yours. I mean, th that wasn't the moment to be like having that conversation. Like, uh, and I definitely feel like the whole subject is much bigger than can fit on a placard, you know. 
But I came off that performance feeling rattled. I was scared because of the violence coming from this guy, he wanted to beat me up. Like I could feel it. Like I've been, you know, I've, I know what that feels like. I've been there before and I, I saw it in his face. It was like, right, this guy wants to punch me in the face. Like, okay. Yeah. And, the, and because the performance is so vulnerable and naked, it's like this poetry performance, it felt even more brutal. So it was like, oh, fuck, there's nowhere to hide, you know. But then I came off stage and Ibeyi were playing the same festival. Um, and I, we, just, we were just hanging out backstage and I was saying, man, that's crazy. Like, I felt freaked out because of this, this kind of protest. And they were saying, well, they had it the other way. They decided to play in Israel. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. And um, they had loads of protests against them, people saying, bomb Ibeyi and whatever. So I, it was interesting for me to just get both sides of it. And it just... I realise that this is a very hot topic for people. Like, but you know, I'm, and and I don't want to present as somebody who has an easy answer to it. I don't have an easy answer to it. But um, as far as I'm aware, the people of Palestine have called for a cultural boycott, and I I have agreed. Like the. But this doesn't necessarily mean that I have um, like a willingness to to kind of discuss the ins and outs of Israel-Palestine at length because I just, you know, I'm, I'm of Jewish heritage. I've got family in Israel. It's, it's a really complicated thing. And this, the kind of where, the, the line between being... Um, anti-Israeli military or anti-Israeli government or even pro-Palestinian human rights mm. and then anti-Semitic. Like, it's, it's been a really confusing time. So you, your question was, does it make you, you know, scared? Mm. Like you want to like not say anything mm. or does it make you like really even more sure that this is what you stand for? And yeah, I mean, it's both. It's confusing, but it's both. In some ways, it makes you just wish you you hadn't said anything, and because you're scared that you're, if you begin to second guess yourself, like yeah. you know, but at the same time, I do believe, I, I believe that this is the right thing for me to do. Hmm. I mean, obviously, I'm not, I'm not, I'm under no false illusion that there's going to be even a. I, in, in the bigger picture, what does this do? What does this gain? But, you know, because there's other artists that will say, for, ev for, every, time, for, ev for every reason I have, mm. there's, a, there's an opposing reason. But um, I'm, I'm trying to go carefully with it, I suppose. But at the same time, stick to what I believe my convictions are. Yeah. You know? Okay, so my final question is going to be about love. Uh-huh. Because, like, you... Your last album, I think, talks so beautifully about love. And um, it also feels in your last album like a conclusion, right? Maybe that's why we forgot to do, love each other. Maybe it actually comes down to this, right? Yeah, I mean, in my experience and in this album, there is this, like, pull back from the bigger picture to the very intimate space of how do how does a person um, spot the barbaric tendencies in themselves spot the traps um, spot the things they've inherited from a toxic culture from a poisonous system you know from a violent oppressive by nature exploitative system like how do we grow up in this culture and not be marked by it in our most intimate relationships and then once you spot that in your relationships how are you able to really do the work on yourself so that when you love you can love fully truly with tenderness and not with the traps of a patriarchal capitalist system that come out in you things like ownership and jealousy and need all the stuff that the album deals with this addiction like stuff about the body and how do you actually be present enough in your relationship but that, that and once you have gone through that journey 
of like trying to improve yourself as a lover. You know, it's like, how could we want our country to change? I want the politics to change. I want to live in a less exploitative system. But if I am practicing exploitation with the person that I'm meant to care most about, or even with myself, against myself, if I can't break these traps in myself, then how can I expect the society as a whole to break the traps? So that in this sense, love becomes like the absolute front line. This is where the big battles happen. Because once you get some sense of how to live with, with love, with love for yourself, with love for your fellow, with love for your, your intimate partner, it then radiates outwards. And at that point, you can, I don't know. For me, it's like, it's big stuff, this. This is like... This is the belief. This is my core belief. Beyond anything else, my belief is love. Like, and it's so easy to say, and I know people will roll their eyes at it, but whatever, this is where I'm at. I believe it. And it's a practice. It's a hard practice. It's like you, you can't take your eye off the ball when it comes to it. In, in a situation where you're faced with violence, can you respond with love? Like, this is the practice. Like, in a situation where you're faced with ignorance, or can you respond with love? And... Um, and can your love be without the traps? You know. So this is this is the thing for me right now. This is the practice. And I think if you have a relationship with music, then you have this like you have this relationship to the infinite, to the eternal. Because that's where the music comes from, that's where poetry comes from. So you have this like relationship to this deeper place and this also tunes me into love and loving and Somehow the two things are linked. When I go out on stage, it's an embodiment of my practice, my spiritual practice, you know. And somewhere all the things are linked up. <laughs> Perfect ending. Thanks, Kate. Much appreciated. No problem. Grand stuff. Thanks, guys. <laughs>